Hello and welcome to Business Standard. Here's a glimpse of the views expressed on the web pages of Business Standard this week. Despite misadventures, a slowdown, and now a recession, India has had a pretty good last decade if one judges by plain economic growth, writes T. N. Nainan as he looks back and forward in his column this week. Going forward, writes Nainan, India should also make inequality and climate change part of its core agenda, following in the footsteps of US President-elect Joe Biden. China is now pulling ahead of India at a quicker pace than it was in 2010, and this will create bigger challenges for India in the next decade, he writes. It is hard to tell whether intensifying power rivalries will result in military conflict, as has happened with previous power shifts. But 10 years from now, the world could look like a very different place, he concludes. Listed companies made their biggest profits in the September quarter in the middle of a lockdown, writes Mahesh Vyas in his weekly column for Business Standard. Firms thought it was okay to cut or contain their wage bill, even though they were making huge profits. Barring the industries that were severely impacted, the lockdown did not threaten the profits of companies at large, as they benefited from a fall in commodity prices. Indian business leaders know it is difficult to get and retain good quality labor. So what explains the wage cuts then? It's quite possible that firms use the crisis to engineer structural changes that were necessary, in other words, to shed excess labor. If this is true, then the lost jobs are unlikely to come back or much of the wage cuts will not be fully restored, writes Vyas. A.K. Bhattacharya writes in a column for Business Standard that taxation and spending outlays usually become key focus areas of all government budgets as they directly impact both the taxpayers and non-taxpayers. But for the next budget, there will be another focus area, reviewing the legal framework for the government's fiscal consolidation roadmap. In its first term, the Modi government had introduced key amendments to the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management or FRBM Act, including requiring the government to reduce its total debt to 40% of GDP by 2025. So what options does the government have now? It would be logical to expect the FRBM Act of 2003 to be overhauled to make the new targets realistic and appropriate to the economy's needs. The creation of a fiscal council, an idea which has been mooted in various circles, could help to write Spatacharya. In his column for Business Standard, Shaman Majumdar takes a look at how Mumbai's Dharavi went an entire day without reporting a single COVID case on the day before Christmas for the first time since April 1st. While the BMC screening and quarantining efforts helped, the success was mostly thanks to thousands of social activists, NGOs and private medical practitioners who are the area's main healthcare providers and who Dharavi trusts. Fearing eviction, Dharavi's people often mistrust BMC staff, so the local health practitioners worked as a bridge, he writes. Social activists and NGOs helped raise awareness and dispel the stigma attached to the disease. If the people's participation has to continue, efforts need to be made to revive Dharavi's economy. Pre-pandemic, it generated more than a billion dollars a year in activity, providing a base for many small-scale industries. Most of it is now ruined, writes Majumdar. With the world now wary of the new strain of coronavirus, Mehir Sharma writes that India must not repeat the disasters of last year. Have we learned the right lessons from the initial response to the coronavirus, he asks. The Indian government was slow to respond to the challenge in 2020, despite many warnings, even from leaders of the opposition, he writes. The government must do three things, according to Sharma. It should accept that the new strain might force local lockdowns, it should revive contact tracing efforts, and it should be transparent in terms of its monthly targets for the vaccination program. So far, it has gotten away just by talking up its expectations of India's installed manufacturing capacity. Now, it must give numbers and allow statisticians to model the interaction of the vaccination program and the infection rate. A recent remark by a well-known politician about the potential balkanization of India prompted Devangshu Datta to explore the subject in his column for Business Standard. But instead of looking at the map of a crumbling USSR in 1991, Datta focuses his attention on the map of the Indian subcontinent in 1721. So in 1720, the subcontinent was a patchwork world of competing kingdoms ruled by many people of different ethnicities and religious persuasions, he writes. Tata writes that this was the result of the Mughals losing control over the previous 50 years and it had a lot to do with the policies pursued by Aurangzeb and his rule. Aurangzeb ran the Mughal economy into the ground, raising tax after tax to fund endless wars. He alienated large chunks of the population with his zealotry and the imposition of discriminatory laws, he writes. Are any of these phenomena visible in the modern India of 2021, he wonders.
In 2020, Indians had their TV, newspaper, OTT and radio delivered even as the media and entertainment industry was being pummeled by a slump in revenues and job losses, writes Vanita Kohli in a column for Business Standard. The state of the news media is embarrassing as newspapers and websites have lost their way. India's news broadcasters are a national shame that have polarized Indians and put them off its national pride, cinema. Enough damage has been done to the Indian film industry by the TV news media by painting it as a den of vice. So what will the shrinking industry do next? What it has always done, its job, Kohli writes. There are scores of journalists who bring you quality news without shouting and screaming. Sometimes they get arrested and harassed, but they will continue. So will the people sitting in production studios, uplink theatres, dubbing theatres and DTS control centres, Kohli concludes. While the next year will see a sharp rebound, it's not obvious that India will return to high growth in the medium term, says Business Standard in an editorial. In part, that's because of India's stance on trade. Even as Indian exports continue to underperform, it appears that India is unwilling to join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the RCEP. The RCEP is the largest trading bloc in the world and most economists had advised the government against pulling out. In fact, India's policies are becoming more protectionist, which will make India a high-cost economy. It's now being argued that India will work on trade agreements with the US and the EU, but such deals are not in sight. The bottom line is that India is isolating itself and this does not bode well for long-term growth, the editorial says. Skepticism about trade has led to policy announcements such as the production links, incentives or the PLI scheme. The first signs of this becoming a permanent drain on the treasury are visible, says Business Standard in an editorial. A body representing mobile handset makers has said its members may miss their targets but should not be penalized. Chances are that the government will compromise in this instance and then over another and finally extend the scheme beyond five years repeatedly. Meanwhile, the sector's lobbying for the schemes will also multiply and existing players in the market are complaining that the PLI scheme benefits new investments and should be tweaked to help them as well. Direct subsidies and picking winners help nobody but bureaucrats and vested interests, the editorial says. The government is reportedly planning to loosen the inflation tolerance ban for the RBI. Inflation has been above target for many months and the fear is that a monetary policy response can affect the ongoing recovery, writes Business Standard in an editorial. But a new RBI working paper, which doesn't represent the official view, has called for keeping the 4% inflation target. If the inflation target is set much above the trend, actual inflation could go up, affecting expectations which can increase the risk premium in financial markets. Also, setting the target much below the trend could result in a deflationary bias and affect economic outcomes. Besides, changing the inflation target despite evidence that it has worked well will affect policy credibility. This could significantly push up trend inflation and increase the eventual cost in terms of loss of output. So the paper rightly notes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, says the editorial. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.